<laughs> Where is the snark directed right now? No, 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 you're, you're doing a really long one page of notes, right? Like, we talked about this. Oh, yeah. Okay. It was me. I know you're all so excited. I am so excited. So let's just, let's just go with it. Here we go. This is it. Time for... Time to get real. Tensors. Woo! Yeah. Okay. So, um, how many of you know what a tensor is? What's a tensor? I would like to know. I would like to. So I would like to know where you got that little nugget of wisdom. Are you going to give it up? Just tell me, because I know. I'm pretty sure I know what the answer is. What's the answer? Where I got it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. What did you say? Yeah. Wikipedia is way better. Yeah, that's categorically wrong. No, I, I don't believe you got Wikipedia. No, this is honestly, I think, I think about it in terms of like scores and everything. Like, I think about it in terms of like scores and rectangles. That's kind of what I Okay, okay. Okay, well, there's a certain someone on campus who likes to convey the idea that a tensor is just a matrix. Is it yeah. <laughs> I'm just not going to talk about that. Call it out. Okay, now, I've done it in previous iterations of this course. I don't think I should do it anymore. Okay, so you're going to leave today knowing what a tensor is, if it, uh, if it kills me. So, some words about tensors, and then I'll give you a definition in a few minutes. Uh, but tensors in this class, and I should say that what I'm talking about in particular is space-time tensors. The word tensor, like the word vector, can be actually applied in a more abstract context, but since we're doing things in space-time, uh, when I refer to a tensor, I'm talking about a space-time tensor. So uh, they represent physical quantities uh, that are invariant. Okay, so again, if we uh, choose different coordinate systems to describe uh, our space-time, uh, the tensor quantities themselves don't care what we uh, use. Um, but have components with a well-defined transformation model. So the words I'm using here, you'll notice, are pretty much exactly what I wrote for vectors and dual vectors. And there's a, um, there's a deep reason for that. And then uh, they live in flat tangent or cotangent spaces. <coughs> or, and I always love to use words to define words, or tensor products thereof. At each point. So that last couple of words, remember when we have a space, and we want to talk about the tangent space, we have to be careful and say the tangent space at a point, because different points on a space can have different tangent spaces. And the tensors and the vectors and the dual vectors, they all live in these tangent or cotangent spaces, which are defined at a point at a time. Okay? Now, I haven't given you a definition just yet. I've just given you some words. But let me give you a bit of notation. Um, so we have actually been working uh, with tensors since we kind of got started. Um, and so uh, the notation we have is that uh, we are going to designate what are called PQ tensors, where the P represents the number of tangent space indices, and Q represents the cotangent space indices. And then to give you an idea of things that we have seen, uh, there is first and foremost the zero zero tensor, which has a special name. What do we call it? Say it louder, say it louder. It's a scalar. 
Okay, in our notation, this would be an object without any indices, even if you write down a coordinate system. We have encountered one zero tensors. We give them a special name. What are they called? Vectors. Those are vectors, because when we break them down into components in a coordinate system, they have one upper index. We have, of course, as of last time, seen zero one tensors, which we also call dual vectors. And believe it or not, we've actually also worked with one particular zero two tensor, though we might not have called it that. What do you think this is? Don't say matrix. <laughs> Although it's very close to the word matrix. It's the metric. The metric of space time, remember we wrote with two lower indices, two cotangent space indices. So this is the metric. And it just so happens that we've also worked with a two zero tensor. The inverse metric. The inverse metric, exactly. Remember the inverse metric has two upper indices. Now this looks like it might be really difficult to remember, like which one is the metric and which one is the inverse. It's actually important that you remember because a little bit later in the class, you're all going to want to start grabbing a Mathematica package to do your uh, tensor manipulations. And in the Mathematica package, you have to define the components of your metric tensor. And you have to realize when you're transcribing from equations on your sheet to Mathematica language that you're giving the components of this, not this. Okay. In, in, it, gets, it gets especially confusing because in special relativity, where the components of this are given by this, these just so happen to be the same as the components of that. Okay? But that's only true in special relativity in Cartesian coordinates. If I pick another coordinate system or if I look at a more complicated space, these two are going to have different components. So you really have to be careful which one you're dealing with. So the metric is the one we call the thing with two lower ones. Okay. And then, of course, there's no reason why we couldn't just, you know, do more complicated things. So 3, 4 would look something like this. And the thing that you should keep in mind is that at the end of the day, the actual quantity in its complete expression would look something like this. That's the actual mathematical expression you're working with. These are, these are dual basis vectors. These are basis vectors. And this is what I mean by a tensor product of them. And you now see why we, in going forward, are more than happy to dispense with writing down the bases explicitly. Because you don't want to write these things all the time. You just want to get by with this. And it turns out that in all of our manipulations, as long as we're sure we're dealing with honest tensors, this part of the story always takes care of itself. So we can really just work with these expressions, the components, and not worry about the basis. Okay? But that's the actual big, nasty, ugly thing that is invariant. Okay. So now, um, are there any questions? Because I'm about to give you the definition of a tensor. There are two definitions of a tensor out there. One is incredibly practical, and one is formal. Which one would you like first, the practical one or the formal one? Formal one. Raise your hand if you want the practical one. Raise your hand if you want the formal one. Wow, you guys are like almost evenly split. Okay, so, but just for fun, because, because last time I taught this class, I gave, the, I gave the practical and then the formal. I think I'm going to go backwards and give the formal and then the practical. I think that's actually how it played out with you raising your hands. So, uh, what is a tensor? 
tensors. So the formal definition is that uh, tensors are multi-linear maps from the space of vectors and dual vectors into the reals. Formal definition has into the reals. Into the reals. <laughs> what are the reals? The real numbers. The real numbers. So like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm obviously not gonna throw this. Well, actually, no. Did, any questions? Besides, like Adrian's question on the board. Okay. No, I would never write something like that up there and think that that means anything. Like, let's go through this. So, what, what do I mean by this? So, we talked about what multilinear meant last time. Okay. So um, really, I'm just going to write down kind of an expression. And it's, it's this expression is going to basically encapsulate the rest of what this means. Okay? So, and I'm going to just do this in terms of components. I'm not going to write basis vectors and basis dual vectors because that's just going to be so incredibly ugly. Okay? So here we go. To illustrate what I mean by this, let's take the tensor T. And when I say that it maps from something to something, what I mean is that this object is given or it's fed a collection of objects, in this case a collection of vectors and dual vectors. And what this does is it takes that collection of things and produces a number. Okay? So how do we give this thing a collection of vectors and dual vectors? Well, it's actually as simple as you could guess. We write them down. Okay, so I'm going to write down a collection of vectors. I'm going to run out of letters very quickly. And I'm going to write down a collection of dual vectors. Where combining these is achieved by simply summing over the indices. So you'll notice for every lower index, I have fed it a vector. And for every upper index, I have fed it a dual vector. Okay. So we know what we mean when we say combine now, because we evaluate this using the Einstein summation convention. Granted, in four dimensions, this is going to have four times four times four times four times four times four times four components. You probably don't want to do that by hand. Okay, but nonetheless, like if, if you were given enough time and coffee <laughs> and explicit expressions for the components of T, you could do this. Okay, but here's the important observation at the end of the day, you'll notice every single one of these indices is summed over. So at the end of the day, what kind of quantity do you get? Scalar. You get a scalar, you get a number, you get something that exists in the reals. Okay. So now, oh, sorry, go, go for it. Is there a reason why you can't write out a complex scalar? Well, yeah, if you are working with complex valued tensors, you're just not going to have complex valued tensors in space time. In more general contexts, you can certainly have complex valued tensors. Okay. So again, all my definitions and my, my verbiage is around the idea of space time tensors. Yeah. That was exactly the question I was yeah. going to ask. Yeah. I'm just not going to keep saying space time tensor, mainly because I'll forget. So I'm going to leave the burden on you to interpret what I mean when I say tensor. Okay, but, but now I hope you can appreciate why we spent so much time focusing on the case of vectors and dual vectors. Because really and truthfully, once you've got vectors and dual vectors on the table, this is like sort of, it feeds into the definition of an arbitrary tensor. Because if you think about it, an arbitrary tensor is really just a collection of vector indices and dual vector indices appended to one object. Yes? So are our transformation lambdas, are those tensors that live in 1-1, one, one, like 1-1 one, one tensors, like the, are they 1-1 one, one tensors? Okay, so excellent question, and that's going to be borne out by the second definition that I'm going to give you, okay? So at this point, though, 
is, is everyone reasonably comfortable with what I mean when I say these words? Okay, and, and you can you can go back to what we talked about last time to see the multilinearity of it. And you can really you can just think about how you can take any one of these objects and make it a linear sum of two objects with the shared index, and then this would just distribute across that sum. So it's a linear operation. Okay, here is the second definition. This is the informal but incredibly useful definition of what a tensor is. A tensor is anything that transforms like a tensor. <laughs> Well, I'm glad we didn't get that one first. <laughs> yeah. So yesterday you said that dual vectors linearly beat vectors and scalars. That was secretly the simplest version of this, because remember, a vector is a tensor, and so a vector can also be fed a dual vector to create a scalar. Vectors and dual vectors are themselves tensors. Okay. All right. Of course, the, 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 the scalar is a tensor, but the scalar doesn't actually require in, to be fed any vectors or dual vectors in order to give you a real. It's already a real. So it's, this is sort of the easiest to feed, and then they just get hungrier and hungrier the more indices. Okay, so this is, I think that this is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> but it is actually the most useful definition of a tensor you're going to see. Because in many ways, um, once we've set up the machinery, the thing that really defines a tensor for us is the particular way that it transforms under coordinate transformations. And again, here is where we get a huge payoff from our work developing the transformation rules for vectors and dual vectors, because if you think of this tensor as a collection of vector and dual vector indices, and you already know how to transform vector and dual vector indices, you just iterate the process for a tensor. Okay. So let me just give you a list of some transformation rules. But I mean, it's really a list that you, you can figure anything out after you've got the first couple of examples. So here are the transformation rules for tensor examples. And again, these are the transformation rules for the components because the whole tensor would be invariant if you also transform the basis vectors and dual vectors. So we know that a scalar, uh, when you do a coordinate transformation, uh, the, the representation of the scalar doesn't change. It's the same number no matter what coordinate system that you use. If we take a vector, then we get a new vector, which we can reach from the old vector by the application of the transformation lambda mu prime mu, where again, this is the transformation matrix, which is carrying me from one coordinate system to another. Of course, we have dual vectors. And then you can just ask, and this is where it gets non-trivial, what about something like t mu nu? Well, here's the good news. Each index gets transformed, okay? And each index gets transformed like a vector index gets transformed. So I write down a lambda mu prime mu and a lambda nu prime nu, and then I contract that with t mu nu. I, I can obviously iterate this process like to infinity, but I'm just going to give you a couple of important examples. Um, if we have a mixed tensor, that's a tensor with an upper and a lower index. Then when we do the coordinate transformation, we just remember that the mu transforms like a vector index, but the nu transforms like a dual vector index. And then, of course, uh, if we have a tensor with two lower or two dual vector indices, 
Um, in all of these, if you remember what you learned from uh, index notation, all of the expressions that I'm writing here should be balanced in terms of indices. For example, if I look at this mixed, mixed thing, you, you want to compare indices across an equal sign, because that's what has to be equal. Don't worry about the arrow, that's a transformation. So if I look at the left-hand side, there's an upper mu prime and a lower mu prime. If I look at the right-hand side, there's a mu here, but that's a mu there, and those get summed and they disappear. Likewise, there's a mu there and a mu there, but those are summed and they disappear. So what you're left with is a lower mu prime and an upper mu prime. Okay. Yes? So what does a transform like a tensor? Something that's not a tensor. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Okay, so no, 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 no. Okay, so I want to I wanna come back. Like, I've given you this definition. You get this out of it, but you're, you, know, you might ask, well, why is it so useful? Well, one of the very incredibly foundational things in this class will be to identify when something is or is not a tensor. Because if it's not a tensor, we should not be working with it for reasons I'll go into in a little bit, okay? And I, it's actually that, that process of building something which is a true tensor is actually the heart of the step that gets you to general relativity and it's actually strikingly similar to the heart of the step that gets you to gauge theory in particle physics. Okay. That's going to be a little bit further on in the course, but, but we have to make sure that we are working with true tensors. So you might say, you know, what's an example of something that's not a true tensor? Well, one, one thing I can, I just, just to make it simple, um, if, we're, if we're working with, whoa, there's too many, too many lines there, uh, in, in four-dimensional Minkowski space, where our tensor transformation rules are these, where these lambdas are four by four matrices that correspond to the Lorentz transformations, okay? This is not a tensor. The three-dimensional momentum. It's not a tensor, it's not even a four-component object. That thing cannot satisfy these transformation rules. It's a vector in space, but it's not a vector in space-time. So that's an example of something that's not a tensor. It gets weirder, though, because you can look at four-component things, and you might think it's a vector in space-time, because it has four components, but just having four components doesn't make you a vector. You have to show that it transforms the right way. And we'll see examples in the next lecture of things that have four components, but they don't actually transform the right way. So we have to kind of massage it a little bit to get the right transformation. So, so this idea that we, we need to be working with things that are te true tensors, that is, they have the right transformation rules, and being very careful you know, to not just assume Oh, it's a matrix, therefore it's a second ring tensor. No. Okay. And by the way, anyone who says a tensor is a matrix would quickly realize that you completely lose the distinction between these three objects. These can all be represented by matrices because they have two indices. But if you just gave me a matrix, I wouldn't know if it was a tensor with two upper indices, a mixed, or two lower indices. I really wouldn't know. That's why we have to label our tensors and we can't just say they're matrices. Matrices are a convenient way of displaying the components, but there's a way more meat to a tensor than just a matrix. Okay. Um, all right, so uh, because you're going to get to play with some of these transformations, um, I want to remind you, get some of this stuff. I want to remind you of some very useful uh, things with regards to transformations. Um, and that is, uh, let's see, so when you have tensors and you want to transform them, you know, by hand on paper, a lot of times you don't want to use index notation, you want to use matrix multiplication, okay? But the rules of matrix multiplication are that we have to do what? And let me just draw a card here, because I need to use my cards. Forest. Yeah. Forest. What do I need to do to an expression like this before I can apply matrix multiplication? You got to phone a friend in the back if you want to call that in. You have to get the matching letters. Exactly. I, I need to move things around until the summed indices 
are immediately adjacent. So my sum indices are mu and mu and mu and mu. So to do that, I could write this. Okay, um, but that's not going to be great because I need to get this flipped around. And so I can write this as that. Okay. And then what we can say is the following. Um, so we start with this transformation. I'm just going to call out a matrix lambda. <coughs> so this is the transformation that you would actually use to transform the coordinates themselves. So this is kind of like the basic transformation. So we're going to call that the matrix lambda. And then as we discussed last time, that would be what? That would be lambda transpose. And so we immediately recognize that this would be lambda T lambda transpose, okay? Because this is just the lambda, this is just the, the matrix T of the components of the tensor, and then this is the transpose, yes? Does it matter if there's a mu on one lambda, a mu on the other? Like, are they different matrices somehow? Okay, yeah, very, uh, yeah, super interesting point, and uh, I, I gotta, I'm glad you asked that, because I need to say this, okay. So, um, when we do a transformation of coordinates, we only do one transformation of coordinates. Like we're going to rotate by 90 degrees, or we're going to boost by, you know, a velocity v in the x direction. So what that means is that in all of what I'm going to write, I'm only doing one thing. There's only one version of lambda. So the lambda that I'm putting here and the lambda that I'm putting here are the same lambda. Of course, here I have to transpose it. So the question is, is it, does it mean something that this one has mu and mu prime and this one has mu and mu prime? It does because it tells you which of the indices of this these things are attached to. But this transformation has a set of elements that's going to be, actually, I should point to these two because this is a transpose. This set of elements is identical to this set. You're only doing one transformation, but you just have to use multiple copies of it to transform something that has many indices. Okay? You would never do like a rotation by 90 degrees here and a boost here. That wouldn't make sense. You're transforming the whole tensor in one way. You just have to do it at an index at a time. Okay. I thought I saw another hand, but perhaps not. Yes? I think, just to clarify, so the lambda of mu prime mu and the lambda that then goes to mu mu prime in the next one, uh, mu mu prime, sorry. Those two are different matrices, right? So why can you say that you can just like switch the order that they go from? Um, it's not, uh, or not, yeah. It's, um, So, yeah, I see, what, I see what you're saying. So, um, if, you, if you evaluated this with index notation, okay, evaluating it with index notation would not require you to identify one of these as a row and one of them as a column. Okay. If you were doing it with just index notation, you could actually write this. Okay. Because it, it wouldn't matter. Because I could list all of the components for you, and then you would just use the summation convention. Okay, the left and right row column is just a designation if we're going to write it as a matrix. And this is just saying, okay, if I'm going to set up a matrix out of these, I need to use the transpose of the matrix for these. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, that was the, the working with matrices, which we do because it's more convenient for a lot of calculations. Um, working with matrices just forces us to be a little bit more careful than we really need to be if we're just willing to go with index notation all the way. Okay, so I'm going to draw a card and pick a victim. Pom. Come to the front. I would like for you to transform H. H for this one? Yeah. Into what matrix? Into by the transformations lambda. And Avery. Yeah. You get to transform G. Oh, <laughs> You're obviously not a member of the varsity pen catching team. 
You can just pick a different spot, Avery. You don't have to like crowd time space. Tom, I'm gonna go right on eight. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> you too can be doing this in the privacy of your own paper. And what I'm looking for is, yeah, an expression in terms of, an expression in terms of, uh, so notice the two lower names. What do you want to end up with? You, 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 oh, you, that's what I meant. That's what I meant. There, you go. there you go. So now, is this the transpose of that? Uh, yes. And then Uber, he's got uh, lambda mu prime mu. Now, our, if this is the transformation lambda, Avery, what are you working with? I'm doing the inverse. Okay. So this is the inverse of, and then I train. Yep. And then, and then the that's also the right is the inverse. Okay. So. Do you need the inverse for each? Aren't they already adjacent to each other? Sorry, say it again? Do you need the inverse for each? Are they not already adjacent to each other appropriately? So, uh, yeah, so here, the indices are already adjacent to each other, mm -hmm. but the prime is down. Oh. The prime, whether, if the prime is up, it's the transformation. If the prime is down, it's the inverse transformation. Okay. Okay. All right, so, so these, these are the two non-trivial examples. That's why I got the suckers to come up and do it. Because I would have probably screwed it up. Um, so, you know, the first thing we do is we move things around to get indices next to each other. So here Tom moved this uh, so that the new and the new are next to each other. We've already got the new and the mu next to each other. But then the thing you have to be careful of is, well, okay, if this is, if this is lambda, what is this? The problem is lambda, that's lambda inverse. And then Avery got the killer because he got to move something over but well and then transpose the first one to get the mu's next to each other but then he had to realize that he's also working with the inverses so he's got the inverse of the transpose and then the inverse of lambda itself all right so uh those are going to be in the notes uh that i'm going to post but you should write them down because you're going to work with those with some transformations you see that one more. okay other questions before we press on yes um, I was just going to make a question on, is, is the, are the inverse of the transpose and the transpose of the inverse the same thing, or is it? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, okay, so, um, so now to a question that was asked before class, actually last time, and then asked again before class and then during class, in this entire scheme, and I'll pick a victim. Benjamin. Benjamin. Lambda has indices. Is lambda a tensor? What is it? What's a transformation? It's a transformation. <coughs> exactly. A tensor is something which has a prescribed transformation rule that rule uses the lambdas. But, yeah. Well, no, no. A dot product is not a transformation. A dot product is a a dot product is actually more akin to this, which is all evaluated in one reference frame. So a dot product is a little more akin to like a, a vector eating a dual vector or vice versa. These are, the lambdas are things which carry you from an unprimed to a primed reference frame. They, they change indices from prime to unprimed or vice versa. Okay. So this, this question of, you know, just because we write things with indices 
you know, some are up and some are down, does that make it a tensor? No, no. This thing has indices, but it's not a tensor. The good thing is, is this is the only thing like this we will ever encounter. It's the only thing with primed and unprimed. So we'll always know that they're transformations and they're not themselves tensors. Um, okay, so other questions for, yeah. Why can't you transform a transformation? Couldn't you just throw on a transformation and then sum over the so um, you 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 can you can transform a transformation. Um, but what you're asking is, can you compose two transformations? So uh, think of the transformations as operators and think of the tensors as things that are operated upon. You can always combine two operations into a one, one composite operation that you act on something with, but you would never take a vector and use the vector to transform something. You could use it to eat something like a dual vector and make a scalar, okay? But, but so I agree with you, you can combine transformations, but I wouldn't use the language of can you transform the transformation, okay? Yeah. In the transformation of G? Yes. Is that, I don't think the second lambda is inverted. Uh, so the second lambda, so the, the inverse is identifying the fact that the prime index is lower, not upper. Because the original version of lambda that I erased conveniently here, the original version of lambda is this. That's what I'm referring to as the matrix lambda. That's just a convention. I'm just saying, let's take this and call it lambda, and then based on that starting point, what are all the other things? And, and, and the thing that we know that we talked about last time is if you have this. No. Do you need a prime? Yeah. That's equal to this. So that's why we identify if we start with a prime up, the prime lower is the inverse. I agree. Do we ever use a different convention where lambda starting has like prime on the bottom? You can use any convention you want. Okay. All you're doing when you do this is you're just picking what matrix you want to write. And, and in this class, I'm never going to write equations with matrices. I'm always going to do it with indices, so it's, never going to, it's always going to be clear. It's just when you actually get into manipulations by hand of actual components, you might want to use matrix manipulation. And so you just pick a starting point, and then it bases everything off that. And you can choose anything you want. OK. Yeah. Um, do the indices somehow represent like C or CT, uh, X, Y, Z? Yeah, so every, every index that you see on this entire thing, they take values C, T, X, Y, Z, but we prefer to call that X0, X1, X2, X3, because then summing makes more sense, but yeah. And, and, that's, and that's what prevents you from only acting on like one index at a time. Okay, so I, I swear to you that at least by the time, by the end of the semester, you will be comfortable with index manipulation, although there's kind of a steep learning curve at the beginning for it. Um, so give yourself time and uh, don't get frustrated. You'll eventually get there. Okay, so, um, so now that we have some definitions on the table, I want to step back and talk about some special tensors because not all tensors are alike. <coughs> so um, a very special tensor is the metric. Okay. In addition to providing us the notion of distance, because remember the metric is intimately associated with constructing a quantity like delta S squared, given a set of coordinate differentials. So the metric is what actually gives us the distance associated with a coordinate differential. Um, and just, just to contrast that, uh, I could take another tensor, say T mu nu, and I could feed it two coordinate differentials. Okay. However, there's no reason why this is going to correspond to the distance between two points squared. This is going to give you a number, but it's not going to be the space-time distance between the two points. It's the metric that serves that role. Okay? 
So the metric is the special tensor that actually gives us information about distance in space-time. The metric is also the special tensor which takes vectors to their uh, corresponding dual vector. And I want to make this clear as well. So we saw this last time, but if I have a vector, say v mu, and I want to figure out what is its dual vector, v lower mu, okay, to get the dual vector, I simply apply the metric to the original vector. Okay, don't be bothered that that's a mu and that's a mu. This is just a label to, to sum over, and I don't want to put a mu here because I'm going to use mu there. If it makes you feel better, I could do this. Okay. Now, just like up here, I could take an arbitrary tensor with two lower indices and I could act on the vector with it. And at the end of this, summing over indices, doing the index dance, Mike, what kind of object am I going to be left with after I sum over mu? Vector. I'll have what index left over? Mu. And it will be upper or lower? Lower. So what, what kind of object? Dual vector. It'll be a dual vector, but we need to give it a different name. Because it is not the corresponding dual vector to the vector we started with. Only the metric provides that map. So it gets weird because anything with indices can do things similar to what other things do, but the way the metric does things with indices is special. Okay? Of course, if the metric is special, so too is the inverse metric. And Kara, in words, if this is what the metric does, can you tell me what the inverse metric does? Exactly. So it takes dual vectors to their corresponding vectors. Okay, and you can see that if I gave you a, a dual vector and you wanted to construct a vector from it, you would just apply the inverse metric to the original vector. Yes? When you say the corresponding dual vector, do you mean in space time or just? Yeah. Okay. So in space-time, each vector only has a single corresponding dual vector. Yes. Are there are there like extensions where like there would be m multiple dual vectors for a single vector? Is that possible in some space? Uh, I don't know. That might happen. I don't know. I mean, it would be you would probably have to be working with a convention where there's more than. I, I don't, I, not that I'm aware of. It, it, yeah, no, I don't think so. Because there's more than one metric that acts in two different spaces. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, if you define, if you, if you define, um, not in any, not in any meaningful sense that I can think of. Cool. Um, okay, so a couple, a couple more very interesting things about the metric that makes it special, and I say these things because I don't want you to assume these things are true of other tensors, okay? A very special thing about the metric, which I've already written down, but I'll write down again, is this. What is that statement? Yeah, well, yeah, this is 0 or 1, depending on whether mu and beta are the same. It's like saying uh, a, a inverse is equal to the Yeah, yeah, this is the statement that this is the inverse of this. Okay? That is not true for a general tensor. If I took a, 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 a 0, 2 tensor, and then I raised both of its indices using the inverse metric, 
and formed this thing, this is not equal to the identity. Okay? It's only for the metric that if you write the metric with two lower indices and then you raise the two indices that you end up with the inverse. It's not true in general. And by the way, the, the metric is a tensor, right? So we can, we can do some metric on metric <coughs> Okay. If I want to create the inverse metric from this, I need to raise each of these indices. So I, I, guess, I guess what we should secretly say is that this takes vector indices to their dual vector indices. Because you don't actually have to do it to a vector, you can do it to an index of something. So, um, so yeah, so I, maybe I need to say this up front. So, let's take a tensor like uh, mu, nu, lambda, okay? Um, let's, let's pick a victim. Actually, this is not a victim. This is going to be like you want your card picked. Oh, it's Sarah. It's <laughs> so funny. Sarah, this is going to be the, everybody's going to be like, damn, I wish I got that one. Pick an index. Uh, lambda. Okay, lambda. Yeah. So I want to lower lambda. Okay. I want to I want to write something with the this object, but with the lambda lower. What do I use? The transformation that flips it. I want to take a vector index and turn it into a dual vector index. What do I use? Oh, a tensor. No. Which tensor? If I no. if I want to use if I want to be dealing with the same object, the method. just yes, Sorry. I want to use the <laughs> method. So if I apply. Uh, beta lambda to this, then I'm going to get w mu nu beta. Okay? If I tried to do this with some other tensor, I would have to give this a new name because it's not the corresponding object. There's some extra information in there that's coming from the T. So when you're, when you're moving indices with the metric, that's literally just moving the indices. You can move indices with other tensors, but they give you different objects. Yeah. In that first example, is there a difference? Like when you wrote the metric, you did beta lambda. Is there a difference between lambda and beta? The good thing about the metric is that it is always symmetric. <laughs> okay. So the metric is the one place where you can be loosey-goosey with the order. With other tensors, you have to be careful. Because, for example, there's a tensor that you're all familiar with from electromagnetism, and we're going to talk about it a little later. That guy right there is a second ring tensor, but it's anti-symmetric. So if I write that versus this, I've got to be careful. Okay, and we'll come back to that a little bit later today. Um, then is it important that you wrote mu v beta instead of beta mu mu on the w? There's no theta up there, that's what's confusing beta, me. Beta, sorry. Oh, beta. Mu, nu, beta? Instead of beta, mu, nu. Well, the lambda is off to the far right, and that's the thing I'm bringing down. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, I could go further with this, right? I could take w, mu, nu, lambda, and I could lower the lambda, but then alternatively, I could raise the mu, and so this is going to do exactly what it looks like. This inverse metric is going to grab the mu and pull it up to make it into a delta, and the metric is going to again grab the lambda and pull it down and make it into a beta, so I'm going to be left with something like this. Okay. Yeah. So is there never a space where the metric is not symmetric? So that's actually a really interesting and a, and a pretty deep uh, idea. So in this class, we are going to be um, formulating Einstein's equations uh, under the assumption of the torsion-free condition. And if you were to allow torsion into your space, you could work with a metric that has an anti-symmetric component. But what's normally done is you just separate out the anti-symmetric part. You break it up into a symmetric metric plus a torsion tensor. And you just work with those as independent objects. So, for all intents and purposes, you can always assume the metric is symmetric, especially for this class. Yes. For that example, I'm sorry. I just that's okay. For the ordering of like which one? Um, this one. That one. Sure. Yeah. For the W, you have mu, mu, lambda. Yeah. If you just raise the mu, how would you order the indices? 
Because you have up, down, up indices. So, so I literally, it, I took this expression and I brought this straight up because this delta mu is going to take the mu and turn it into a delta. And then I literally dropped the lambda straight down. But what if you didn't lower the lambda? Oh, if I didn't lower the lambda? Mm -hmm. How would you write it? Like that. That makes sense. So it doesn't, but the order of up, it doesn't necessarily have to be like up, then down. Because in that space, that's like a three dimensional object, and you're defining like. Yeah, you, you generally, um, for reasons which we'll discuss later, you generally, when you write a tensor, um, you, you keep, you, you kind of imagine that there are these bends to the right of the tensor. And in each bend, you can place an index either up or down. But don't just arbitrarily shift things sideways with bends. So, you know, if I could put an index here, and an index here, and an index here, and an index here, and an index here. Okay? When I raise or lower these indices, keep them in their bend. Just bring them up or down. Okay? Yeah? Um, so, would it be the same for the new, even though it's in the middle? Since it wouldn't be. Like, what if you wanted to raise the new? So, if I applied a gamma new to this, I would end up with that. Okay. Yeah. Is there. So, transpose flips the order of the... Like well, transpose at, transpose at this point is something that's only meaningful for second oh, tensors. Okay. Is there something that lets you shift the order of the indices? Uh, generally, no. Okay. Um, I mean, you might have... So, uh, you can talk about what are called index symmetries or index manipulations, and we're going to have a, a lecture where we talk about that, but... So there, we're going to work with this uh, tensor uh, that looks like this a lot. Okay, that's the Riemann curvature tensor. Um, and then there's going to be discussions about, well, what happens if you take these two and interchange them? Is it symmetric? Is it anti-symmetric? What happens if you take these two and interchange them? Is it symmetric or anti-symmetric? And we're going to explore those index symmetries of that tensor. So. I'm going to stop looking at you guys because you keep asking me questions. I'm never going to finish. Uh, no, no, these are good questions, and I understand that this is a, this, you know, these index gymnastics are not um, completely true. Okay, so, um, so we, so now, now that I've said all that, uh, you can obviously, if you want to take the metric and turn it into its inverse, you can just do some eta on eta action. So you can use the inverse metric to raise mu and then use the inverse metric to raise new. And at the end of that, well, holy Hannah, you just end up with the inverse metric. Okay? Yeah, I know. It's, it's not the most interesting manipulation. Okay, Wait, interesting one. Uh, this is truly going to be a victim. Yeah. Does that imply that the, the delta is some, some like that, that delta I mean, because it, it means you're changing one of the matrix. Like, like your, your, so the, the delta, the way Yeah, yeah, so, so, so one way to think about it is that this thing became delta, delta. <laughs> delta, delta, delta. Uh, yeah, this is the metric and the inverse metric where you're summing over one index. And so that gives you a delta function on the remaining indices. And then this delta function with this just makes this new into a delta. And that's what we get there. Cool. Shouldn't it be delta gamma though, not gamma delta, because mu came before new? Or I thought that was important. Okay, if it wasn't symmetric. Okay. Uh, that would it be so the the mu? Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. You're right. Sorry. Wow. That's uh, you're you're totally right. You're totally right. Thanks. Okay. So now uh, going to get a victim. <laughs> Chase. Chase, you get the hard one. What about this eta on eta action? Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's hot. Say it again? Well, be careful. Look at the indices. Uh, you're pretty far back in the room, but look carefully at those indices. What do they do? Yeah, they totally sum out, because I've got mu, 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 mu. So what kind of quantity should this return? It should be a scalar. It should be a scalar. The question is, what scalar? 
Four. One. I'll say one. One? Why? Four. Why? Because he's some across the diagonal. Yeah, this is the trace of the metric. <laughs> However, this is this is where it gets interesting, folks. Shh, listen. If you wrote the met the metric as a matrix, you would write this. And if I said trace the metric, what would you think the answer is? Three. Two. 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 You would think minus one plus one is zero, one plus one is two. Okay? But this is the definition of the trace. This is also what you were working with in your in your last homework assignment secretly. But this thing you can think about as follows, okay? And this is a sort of a way to, to envision these things. Let's for a moment do this with something that we're already familiar with, and that's this. What does that give me, Danielle? What does this give me? That's gonna give you. So the mu's are summed, and I have a new and a delta. Of um, it's going to give you a delta. <laughs> yeah, a delta function on nu and delta. Okay. Now to figure out to figure out what this is <laughs> to figure out what this is, I just come down here and I take the delta and I make it a new. But that makes this a new. But remember, I sum over repeated indices. So this is literally this matrix summed down the diagonal, which is, of course, 4. four. OK? All right, um, I got a couple of more things I have to uh, talk about. See, I have a lot. I have like six pages of notes. Alex, uh, why is the new on the left and not the right? The upper one. <laughs> I'm sorry, we keep talking about it, and then I thought it was important, but then you just keep doing it. I don't know if that just Which one, on this? Yeah, so you're changing the new to new, right? What? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, so, you're, so you started with new, new, right? And then you said, don't switch bins, only go up and down, but now you're going to switch your bins on me, and I'm just getting confused. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, so this is delta new delta. You okay with that? Yes. Now I make the delta into a new. Well, yeah, but that's after you just switched it. <laughs> <laughs> there are times to worry and there are times not to worry. So much about switching. I feel stressed. This is the order not matter. Yeah, it's easy. On the metric. The order doesn't matter on delta either. I, yeah, but in general it matters. So why not stay consistently good? <laughs> okay, then, then I'll try to stay consistently good with you for you. For you. Okay, um, so there's so there's one very very important thing we need to consider uh, in terms of all this tensor bullcrap, um, and that is uh, remember we said that the coordinates themselves transform a certain way. And it turns out that the coordinates themselves transform like a tensor. What kind of tensor do you think that they transform like? Well, I mean, I'll give you a hint. That's the coordinates, and it has one upper index. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, these transform like a vector. So is that not a vector? This is not technically a vector. Okay. Okay. Because a vector has to have some kind of magnitude associated with it. This is a set of labels of a point. You are taught in calculus about this very evil thing called a position vector, which extends from the origin to the point of interest. That is not a vector, okay? The position vector fundamentally depends on the coordinate system you pick, right? The length of it does. That's not a vector, according to our definition. So this is not a vector itself, but that's a vector, okay? However, um, you know, if I ask how do the coordinates transform, they transform like a vector. So an important question is, uh, what about the derivative with respect to the coordinates? What about coordinate derivatives? What do they transform like? Okay. And the good news is, is here we can play a very familiar story. 
if I take the derivative with respect to x mu of the coordinates x nu, okay, this is simply a delta function on mu and nu. Now, this guy is an invariant, and we know how this transforms, <laughs> so we can figure out how that trans I told you you're going to get a lot of mileage out of this. <laughs> we know how this transforms. How do you think that the derivative has to transform? As a dual vector. A dual vector transforms in the inverse way that a vector transforms. Well, guess what? If I squinted my eyes and I compared this to this, there the index is up, there the index is kind of down, because it's in the denominator. <laughs> in fact, in fact we, we explicitly remind ourselves of that with the notation like that. So when I write D with a lower index, I'm referring to this. What if you're taking the derivative with respect to a dual vector? So what if you're taking this? That's perfectly well defined. Now what if you're doing d over d x nu or d yeah. or d yeah. Oh, okay, so so that's that's a that's a funny thing. That's a good question. It's a funny object. Like, so the question is, what is this? Is this d x mu? Okay. So here's the bottom line. We don't ever refer to dual coordinates which is what this object would be. Okay. We don't have any need to introduce things called dual coordinates. So if you ever encounter that object, which you will, you just understand that object to be this. So take the normal derivative, raise it, and then that's your, that's your, your derivative with an upper index. Okay. So uh, important lesson, the derivative transforms like a dual vector transforms, okay? Now, I'm not saying the derivative is a dual vector, okay? It transforms like a dual vector. It's the same way as saying the coordinates aren't vectors. They transform like vectors, okay? Now, what I mean by that is I can take the derivative and act on something like a scalar, and then that thing transforms. That thing is a dual vector, and it also transforms like a dual vector. Okay. Yes. So if four velocity is kind of like the derivative. We're not, I don't want to go to four velocity yet. That's next time we're going to talk all about it. So I don't want to go there. I want to end with, uh, yeah, I got, a, I got a couple of important things to hit before we, we bug out of here. Okay, so um, So I've given you sort of, you know, some definitions, some motivations for tensors. I've certainly given you lots of lessons on index gymnastics. And again, these are not the kind of things which you just absorb and you master uh, uh, passively. You have to work with these indices and these various quantities to get comfortable with them. So expect there, this to solidify through doing the homework. Um, but what I want to talk about for a moment, because this is going to be sort of uh, bedrock of our path forward um, is tensor equations, because we're in the end going to be writing equations, like something equals something, not just like writing an object and going, look at this pretty object, you know, <laughs> equations. So um, the, oh, there's so many words on this page. <laughs> um, so, so, so if, so the, 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 world, the world has no predetermined coordinate system, right? You know, we don't walk out in the street and like, oh, look at that big x and y axis. Everything should be in terms of that x and y axis. So coordinates are a crutch that we meager humans use in order to explicitly write down laws of, of, of nature and so forth. Um, but at the end of the day, you need to be really careful to make sure that your fundamental laws do not depend on the coordinates that you're using, or that physical results do not depend on the coordinates, okay? So one way to do that is to 
only write your physical laws in terms of scalars, right? I mean, because if a scalar is sort of by definition this thing which doesn't care what coordinates you use, it doesn't even have components. It just it doesn't care, okay? Um, that's, you know, so we can write a physical law that says A equals B, where A and B are scalars, and it's, a, you know, an equation because it's got an equal sign. And then if I choose some different coordinate system, that physical law is going to look like this. But since they're scalars, that's exactly the same as A equals B, okay? That's a pretty limited situation, okay? So what we would like to do is we would like to be able to work with things that are a little bit more complicated than scalars. Um, and then we know that, of course, the objects that are invariant but do interesting things are tensors, okay? So again, the physical things you're working with should be coordinate independent, but we would like for them to perhaps have interesting behavior when we do provide coordinates, and that is exactly the sort of motivation I gave for vectors, dual vectors, and tensors. They're physically coordinate independent if you take all of the bits together, but then they have components which do transform if you write them in, in that way, okay? So where it gets confusing is the following. I could write a tensor equation, say like T is W plus A, and I could secretly come in here and say, yeah, man, T is like, if I expand it in its components, I don't want to repeat things, mu or W lambda mu, happy face, okay? <laughs> and then we do this big nasty string of basis vectors and dual vectors, then I could write the left-hand side and then I could similarly do the same things with W and A. They would actually have to have the same index structure because when you add tensors, they have to have the same index structure. And this would just end up being this ginormous equation that would probably lap the board a couple of times. And then if we transform a coordinate system, we would find magically that at the end of it all, the expression would look exactly the same. No one wants to do that. It sucks, okay? What we want to do is write equations like this. Okay, just with the components. But here's where it gets tricky because if we just work with the components, then this equation is not invariant. Like it transforms because the components of tensors transform when we do transformations. Okay? So, um, but here is, the, here is the fundamental observation which will pay off big time later on when we're trying to identify tensors. When we work with tensor equations, in particular with components, we are fine as long as the left-hand side transforms exactly the same as the right-hand side. Which, by the indices that you see, you would say, well, duh, of course they transform the same way, right? But remember, whenever we work with a quantity, we have to actually verify that this actually transforms the way you expect it to based on its indices, because that's not always guaranteed. Like, I could throw you a collection of objects and say, is that a tensor? And you check it out, and you're like, nope, it's not a tensor. So as long as we verify that all of these things transform in the right way, then just because you look at each side and the indices line up, you know that the transformation of the left is going to be the same as the transformation of the right. And what's important is if you go back and put in all the basis vectors and basis dual vectors to complete the story, the whole equation will be invariant. It's just crucial that you get the index structures on each side to line up and to make sure that every quantity you're working with is genuinely a tensor. Okay. Now, just to give you an idea of why that gets crucial in a big step a little later in the semester, at the moment, we are going to say that something like this is a tensor, okay? The derivative of a one form is, or, oh, sorry, a one form, a dual, a dual vector is a tensor, okay? However, at a certain point in the course, we're going to decide that that's not a tensor, and we're gonna have to fix it. Okay? And it's in the fixing of this thing, it's identifying the problem and then fixing it that will actually get the machinery of general relativity in our about. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna finish with a really nice uh, illustration of the power of tense wars. Uh, 
Um, and, and, and obviously, you know, obviously, That's a valid tensor equation if everything I'm working with are tensors, right? Because if I look at the second term, lambda gets summed over, so it disappears, and then I'm left with mu nu beta, which is exactly what I have here and here. Okay? So you can have extra indices in there as long as they are summed over because they're effectively non-existent. And you can look at the transformation of all of these terms. And what's nice is when you do the transformation of these terms, the transformation of this is canceled by the transformation of that because vector and dual vectors transform in opposite names. Okay, so I'm just going to finish up with an example of tensor equations uh, which you may or may not have seen. So let's start with <coughs> some hopefully relatively familiar expressions written in maybe a slightly different notation than you used to. Of course, what am I writing? Yes. So you'll notice that's my notation for a derivative with respect to time. equations does this represent? This first line. How many scalar, or not scalar, how many individual component equations does it represent? That's what I should say. Three, three yeah, it's, it's a vector equation in three spatial dimensions. So this is secretly three equations. What about this? It's one, right? It's a dot product on the left-hand side. So this just gives me a number, this gives me a number, so that's one. What about this guy? Three and one. one. Okay. So a total of eight equations. Okay. Now, Maxwell's equations um, are uh, obviously uh, they're invariant under rotations. What's not obvious in the way that this is written is that they are invariant under boosts. In fact, it's very, very hard to see that they're invariant under boosts written in this way. This is a very non-covariant way. You're breaking up space and time in a way that you really shouldn't. Notice there's time derivatives. Bad for business if you want to make things nice and relativistic. So what I want to do is I want to write Maxwell's equations in a relativistic form, but I want to utilize tensors. And what we discover is that two things happen. The equations get simpler, and the symmetries become much more obvious. So you get two payoffs. So in order to do this, I'm going to introduce a four-component vector J, which is just built out of the charge density and the components of the current density. Okay, these are the things that appear here and here. This has X, Y, Z components, and that's just a, a component on its own. And then I'm going to introduce the two-component 0 to field strength tensor, F mu nu, which takes the following form. So you'll notice that that thing represented as a matrix is just a collection of the components of the electric and magnetic field vectors. Okay. And you'll notice among other things that it, it is anti-symmetric. If you flip it along the diagonal, you get minus what you started with. Introducing those two quantities. No, I noticed that, uh, this is nothing new. This is just a repackaging of the stuff that's in here. These equations have the components of E and the components of B and then the components of J and the components of rho. I'm just packaging them into four component and four by four or 16 component objects. Okay. Clearly though, this is going to fit nicer into space time. All right. So with that in mind, <coughs> 
Maxwell's equations become the following. So let's, let's just do a little bit of counting. Notice in this first equation, the mu is summed, so the mu disappears. So the left-hand side just has a nu, and the right-hand side has a nu. So how many component equations does this represent? Four, because nu takes four values. And, and I'm, I'm, this, is, this, is, you know, this is electrodynamics in four dimensions. So this is four equations, and it clearly represents these four equations. Because these are the only ones that have sources, the J and the row. This one's not so obvious. Okay, so what the brackets mean is that you completely anti-symmetrize over the exchange of indices. Right? Among, uh, so let's see, so, um, So if, I, uh, so if I give you a pair of indices, so maybe we'll start with a pair operation. If I tell you to anti-symmetrize over those indices, what do you think that means? So if I, if I sorry, okay, so people might not have seen this. So I'm gonna give you this object, and then I'm gonna ask you to create this object. To create this object, you want to anti-symmetrize over the indices, and what that means is you do the following. Because what we've discovered is that this object, if we reverse the indices, so if I literally flip the order of these, is minus the object I started with. So if I flip the order of these, I flip the order everywhere in here, but then this term is minus this term, and this term is minus this term, so I'm really just minus the whole thing. So that's why I'm saying I've anti-symmetrized over the indices, because in this, in this object, if I switch these, I get the object back with a minus sign. Of course, you can symmetrize over the indices, and you would write that like this, and then you would do the same thing but with a plus sign. And then this object, if you switch the indices, is always going to come back to itself. I want to stress, this object and this object are not this object. Okay. Now, three indices. It's a little weird. Okay. But you can play around with this definition, generalizing it to three objects. But I just want to do this counting argument for you, because I think this at least gives you some confidence that this might be right. Um, when we have an anti-symmetric object, what do we have to make sure of so that we don't get zero from this expression? Equal. Yeah, that they're not equal. Because if I pick, for example, the one one element of this, then I'm, I'm doing one half F11 one one minus one half F11, one one, and that's zero, right? So the non-zero terms are the ones where these have different elements. Okay? So let's just come up here. The non-zero terms are where these take different values. But we can actually write down what those terms would be. So I could start with a zero, a one, and a two. Those are all different. So maybe make this zero, make this one, make this two. Or just pick any any of them to be zero, any of them to be one, any, as long as there are three different ones. I could pick zero, two, and three. Remember our indices go zero, one, two, three. Okay, I could pick one, two, three. Or I could pick zero, one, three. And that's it. You agree? How many non-zero terms do we have? We have four. So there are four versions of that equation. 
which correspond exactly to these four equations. Okay. In your homework, you're going to get to demonstrate at least half of this explicitly. So in your homework, I'm going to ask you to take probably this one, maybe this one if I'm feeling mean, but take this one, take this definition and this definition and show that this gives you exactly this set of equations. Okay? Which we know it must. All right. We'll finish up there. And see you on Tuesday. And for those of you who don't remember, Monday nights in the lounge over there is basically homework help session. So 7 30 will be in there. Turn it up. Okay. Yeah, these are the basic ideas. So these so I think I said this earlier at the beginning of the semester. So these equations are derivable from electron. These are not. Literally, if you write down the electromagnetic Lagrangian, and you vary it to get the equations of motion, usually.